Hello everyone, my name is Max Easy, and over the last six months, I'm looking at leaders among species of crickets. So this originally came to my mind as I wondered how I could differentiate leaders from non-leaders in nature. And ideally, I'd be looking at genetics, but since I don't have those resources, I'll instead be looking at phenotype and behaviors. Some initial problems I ran into included what organisms to test with this. So I know I needed an organism that I could keep in a constant environment, an organism where I could notice physical differences, and where I could differentiate gender. That of course led me to crickets. In my preliminary data, I wanted to answer the question whether or not crickets were clones. In order to do so, I'll look at physical and behavioral differences. Assuming there are preferences, or excuse me, assume, assuming there are variation would imply that they are not clones. And then I wondered if these outliers would be the leaders. In terms of preferences, I claim that crickets will favor well-lit, warm, and compact environments. I also think they'll tend to be in groups rather than isolation. And through research, I found that crickets tend to act differently with an audience around them. However, I noticed through observations that they did not act altruistically, or at least they did not act towards other crickets in society. In terms of leadership, I claim that the leaders will be, be able to win over the mates in terms of physical positioning or where a leader would be located within a group of crickets. I imagine the leader would be somewhere on the outside rather than the inside. They will not hide and they will be more mobile. I also think that leaders will be larger and have longer antennas because they will be able to perceive the world around them better as crickets do using their antennas just as people do using their eyes. I don't think they will act together in fight or flight since I said earlier that they do not act for the rest of the group. However, I do think that the leaders will fight given a scenario in order to impress the other crickets around them. Even though I don't think crickets will tend to fight in isolation, I wondered if there were enough crickets that were non-leaders, would they all fight against a common enemy? So then I got my first batch of crickets, and at first glance, they all look pretty similar. So I needed to identify them, and I did so by painting them, giving them each a color, and being able to assigning them a number for my data. Then I ran into another issue with determining gender. So when we look at the left, we look at what I perceive to be a female, and when we look on the right, it's what I perceive to be a male. Now it's deceiving in this picture, however, females tend to be larger than the males. Also, through research, I found that females have this vestigial style wing where their wings are straight back and more noticeable than the males. Also, males only have two appendages, these points sticking out their back, while female has a third appendage that sticks straight back. However, I could not definitively conclude whether or not each cricket was male or female, and so going forward, these conclusions based on gender will, again, not be 100% accurate, so I could not say they are foolproof moving forward. So I got into my first preliminary uh, test, looking at spacious versus compact areas, looking for preferences amongst crickets. I dropped them in the middle of a box, and if they prefer spacious areas, they would stay closer to the center of the box, away from the walls. And if they prefer compact areas, they would go towards the walls. I did so using this data table, plotting points at time equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 minutes, which is what I would do throughout the rest of this presentation. I found it more helpful to use a color-coded data table. In this case, the deepest, darkest reds indicate that a, a cricket was in a corner. And then it follows that Roy G. Biv that rainbow or visual light spectrum. So as the red lightens and shifts to orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple, they are getting farther and farther away from the walls. What we can see with this data is that crickets tend to stay along the walls. I then did the same thing with all the crickets together in a group, and here I collected similar data. The crickets tend to stay towards the walls. I'd like to point out that there is an outlier here that cricket number two, however that cricket had a deficiency and did not move at all. I then went on to test light. Testing light I used a thin glass tube 
which I used for many other experiments after this. The thin glass tube allowed the crickets to move only in one direction, towards or away from their preference, and it would allow them not to move left, right, up, down, or any other direction. So I created a gradient of light using a black plastic bag covering the entirety of the right hand side third of the tube and then alternating two centimeter wide strips every two centimeters across the middle to give like a middle ground of light and darkness before giving a complete exposure to light on the left hand side. Then using these graphs and data tables I found that crickets tend to prefer darkness when isolated. However, when in groups, they seem to prefer light. I found this odd, and so I thought that I might have messed something up. When looking at my data, I started three crickets in the light, and on the one before, I started the majority in the dark. So I thought, maybe I should do these tests again. And that is exactly what I did. This time, I started them all in light rather than in dark for isolation, and found that they still heavily preferred dark. Then, when I put them in groups, I started more in dark this time than in light, and once again we see that they prefer darkness over light. This is shown here as a large group of crickets are all in the dark third of the glass tube. Then I went on to test heat. Here we see a wire that is hooked up to a 10 volt battery. The wire is then coiled around the tube. On one end of the tube, I put many coils to generate more heat. And then to create a gradient, I put less coils around the middle and less as it went down until eventually no coils at all. And this would be the coolest end of the tube at about room temperature. I then use this data table that I will use throughout the rest of this presentation where time again is going across on the x-axis. The cricket number is labeled vertically on the side. And then all the data points or all those large numbers in between are the distance from the heat source. So the lower the number, the warmer the area. You can see here I started half the crickets in the hottest end of the spectrum and half the crickets in the coolest end of the spectrum. And when we look at the dispersion of data points, we can see that the cluster of points across the x-axis gets tighter and tighter. And also they seem to go lower and lower. Then we did the same thing looking at crickets in groups rather than isolation. And we see a similar pattern as time goes on, the data points become closer together and go lower on the graph. Then I tested groups versus isolation in crickets. Here we can see two crickets on the right preferring to be in a group, while one cricket on the left is isolating itself. This time I differentiated the crickets using numbers because their paint wore off. Now here I have a large bit of data. This color coded section indicates each cricket. So cricket number three had a deficiency and that's why it did not move throughout the five minutes. So I did not use it going forward, but I wanted to put it here. Also cricket number one will be in red throughout this experiment, two orange, cricket number four is yellow and five is green. These black bars here indicate the first trial. In the first trial, I put one dead cricket in the center of the tube, and then I measure the distance from of the live cricket from that dead cricket to see if they prefer to be in groups or not. And then I increase the number of groups with more and more dead crickets that I move to one position. So then I put two dead crickets, four, six, and nine. Here we see a lot of data points, again color coded by each cricket that we saw on the last slide but a little difficult to tell what's going on. So then we look at the averages and see that although as time increases the crickets do tend to go closer to the group, even at its peak they're about 30 or 40 centimeters away, which is about half the length of the tube, and so it is hard to say whether or not they prefer to be in that group because they're still maintaining a good distance. And then it got into an interesting point in my long term when I decided to look at different graphs. So now I'm looking at individual preferences within crickets rather than the total preferences of all crickets. And here we can see cricket number one, two, and five all have similar preferences where they tend to approach the group but still keep a noticeable distance.
However, with cricket number four in the bottom left hand corner, we see that that cricket tends to migrate directly towards the group and stay very close throughout the entirety of the experiment. This is similarly shown here as the crickets are color coded and now we're looking at as the group increases what is the preference of all crickets. We see some interesting data here because once again we see that yellow fourth cricket that we saw before preferring to be in groups again preferring to be in groups for the majority although we do see some outliers with six crickets on that fourth graph on the right side and we see crickets that before stayed isolated are now preferring to be in groups. I decided to do this experiment again with live crickets because they will be seeing live crickets in society. So now I want to point your attention to time equals five minutes or this fifth heading here and I want to show that as time increases the range of numbers decreases meaning the crickets are getting closer together. However, we do see a tendency for multiple crickets to be close together, but there would also be an outlier seen in the bottom three rows under five minutes. What I can conclude from my preliminary data is that crickets are not clones because there's variation. However, overall, crickets do tend to prefer heat, darkness, tight areas, and they'll mostly stay in groups. They also tend to scout or scan, as I observed so they'll run back and forth and observe the area around them. There's also a difference in tendencies for crickets when in isolation versus when they're in groups. And as we predicted earlier, there's not much action towards other crickets. So I can finally get to my final data. From here on out, I'll define leaders by measuring physical characteristics. So basically I'm implying that size implies dominance and dominance implies leadership. Now, as we went over earlier, since females are a bit larger than males, the leadership ranking here will favor females. I also wanted to point out that leadership does not predict longevity. This actually makes sense if you think about it, because crickets that are leaders may tend to take more risks and so therefore may die sooner than non-leaders. I felt another way to measure leaders would be to have crickets run through a maze to show their intelligence ability to learn, and athleticism. However, there was no motivation for the crickets to run through the maze, so that idea was scrapped. I'd lastly like to point out an important idea. That idea is that leaders are relative. That means that in order for there to be a leader, there has to be other crickets to compare them to. So in isolation, there is no leaders. However, I wanted to look at if there's a leader in a group, does that leader act differently when in isolation? Also, if there are a group of 10 crickets, for example, then there's the one main leader. But if we take the four smallest crickets out, or the non-leaders, and isolate them in their own group, then the largest of those four small crickets is now a leader of its new society. So now we'll take a look at what and why I measured. I measured the length of the body of each cricket, and then I measured the length and number of antennas, also the length and number of legs. However, I only use the back leg as the back leg is uh, the most prominent leg for crickets to use for running, jumping, etc. And I found that the, leg, the length of the leg was pretty much proportional to the length of the body. I also measured the length and number of appendages and the length and number of feelers, those mouth parts up front. And I decided to measure not only length, but abundancy of body parts, because I felt that as length and number of these body parts increased, these crickets would be able to perceive the world around them better, thus become better equipped for their environment, and more likely to be a leader. So I then made these into three different probabilities in order to find leaders amongst these species of crickets. First, I multiplied all the measured values straight across. Then in another test, I added them all across. And then I added them all across, but I added weights to each value. In all three cases, I got the same order with crickets that I previously numbered 4, 3, 5, 8, 9, 7, 10, 1, 2, and 6. If that wasn't conclusive enough, I made the graphs 
and you can see here when I multiplied the values and when I added the values with the weights to them the graph has the exact same shape however when I added them together alone the numbers were a lot smaller so they were a lot closer together however the order remains intact so I can now properly rank leaders amongst these crickets which allows me to now get into my test regarding cricket leadership so this was after corona so now I'm at my house and I want to thank my dad for helping me build all these apparatuses so we first get into the tightness of angles using a 30 60 90 degree triangle this graph basically just shows what we already knew is that crickets tend to prefer to be in corners rather than in space however when in isolated we look at the 30 degree corners we find two outliers here in this relatively static shape in graph we see cricket number four and cricket number ten in the tightest corner the 30 degree corner at all times what's interesting there is that cricket number ten is obviously the smallest cricket however it's actually the smallest perceived male cricket and cricket number four is the smallest perceived female cricket here we see a picture of how I tested this as I dropped the cricket into the center started the timer and plotted points at each minute of where the cricket was and then when I put them in groups we again see that while most crickets prefer to be in corners it is especially abundant in leaders however when we look at the tightest corners we see that cricket number 10 that was in the corner very often only go down to one instant this is again shown here with three crickets in the tightest corner and the rest of the crickets hovering somewhere in the middle. What I concluded is that once again tighter areas are preferred amongst all crickets, while the smallest crickets spent less time in the tightest corners than the larger crickets. I found this correlation in my, in my graphs, however I cannot conclude causation, although I would speculate that these crickets are moving less and they are hiding in the corners because they fear the larger crickets, the leader crickets, that are in the tightest corners when in groups, so they're hiding in opposite corners. Also, I put an asterisk by anything regarding male or female, because like I said, I could not definitive, definitively conclude male or female. But what I perceive to be male and female, these smallest male and smallest female crickets spent the most time in the corners, especially the tightest corners in isolation, which I could again speculate may be due to hiding from other predators. Then I went on to test heat preference. I emulated that thin glass tube from school with a thin wood stage at my house. You can then see my makeshift apparatus here using uh, some books, rubber bands, and a hair dryer with an attachment to stop air from blowing out, but instead just have the heat and then I covered it all in a screen so that the crickets could not get out. We can see the data here and it seemed to be a lot of back and forth and not a strong preference. When they look at the averages we see that that is the case. A lot of middle ground for crickets went in isolation which tended to be a lot of scanning so some that were really close to the heat source and really far away and pretty much just running back and forth. However, when in groups, we see much different data. In groups, we can see as leadership ranking increases, the distance from the heat source decreases. That is again shown very clearly with this drop off amongst non-leaders. So I can conclude that non-leaders or smaller crickets tend to stay in warmer areas than leaders or larger crickets when in groups. And again, I would assume that the smaller crickets are more likely males, so maybe the males are staying in warmer areas and the females are staying in less warmer areas. My next test was on light, so here I wrap the entirety of the wood apparatus in ceram wrap, and then in order to create that light gradient, I put a double layer of screening across the middle third and a thick dark piece of cloth on the right hand side third. Then we can see from a cricket's perspective the light coming in on this first third then going into a light shade and then pure darkness. This just shows 
once again that for all crickets, darkness was preferred over light and especially over that middle ground. However, we see that the leader cricket tended to be in the light more often than the non-leader crickets. That is again shown here with that blue point as the leader cricket spends more time in the light than the rest. We even see that cricket number four once again being the second most common, which we believe to be the largest male cricket. So I can conclude that in isolation, crickets tend to prefer darkness. However, they move in and out of darkness when in groups. And the leaders move into lighter areas for longer periods of time in groups and isolation. And what I perceive to be the largest male and largest female, they spent more time in the light than their male and female counterparts. We get to the penultimate test here with isolation versus group preference, where we can see three crickets underneath the saram wrap all in a group. Now what we want to look at with these graphs is how close the different colored data points are together along the y-axis because that is how close the crickets are together and the closer the data points are together the more likely those crickets are to be in a group. I also used gold data points to indicate the leader. On the next slide we look at three different crickets and I used them in a ranking of gold, silver, and bronze to indicate leaders and then on the slide after that, I used that same gold, silver, and bronze, but then I followed that Roy G. Biv spectrum throughout the rest in terms of ranking leaders. So when I was looking at this graph, I wanted to see closeness and proximity. But what I actually found was that the leader crickets are moving throughout the five minute period, while the non leader crickets are stagnant throughout the five minute period. You can see with a horizontal trend line for that blue cricket in all three graphs. And then as cricket numbers increase, we see that same trend, especially in that graph on the right hand side. We even see it with four, five, and six crickets respectively. However, I don't want to conclude definitively again looking at how looking at that top left graph, it almost seems definitive that they want to be in a group. However, since they all started close together, it almost seems like there is a possibility that they just weren't moving. So, however, again, looking at those bottom two graphs, we see that leader, especially in that bottom left-hand graph, move away from the group and eventually come back. But then we see a middle ground leader cricket in red isolate itself from the rest of the group. What I can conclude from this is that in small groups, leaders tend to roam while non-leaders will stay put, and in larger groups, crickets will move less and tend to stay in groups. Finally, we can see how crickets react to a predator. I achieved this small spider from my house, and you can see it all balled up here. And since the spider is so small, I put it in a smaller apparatus, a smaller glass vase to induce a greater likelihood for interaction between the spider and the cricket. Once again, we see that there's maybe that first cricket and that last cricket that are tending to move closer to the spider as their distance from predator decreases. However, when we look at the graph, we do not necessarily see any crickets that are actually coming into contact with the spider, as they did not. And that is shown here, although, again, possibly seeing that leader, that uh, largest male ranked at four, and seeing a trend with the, as the size of males decreases, a closer proximity to the spiders but again keeping their distance and then when we put them in groups this was to see if the crickets would act together and take on the spider however that was not the case and when we look at the averages we again see that all crickets basically kept their distance now you could say that again the leader cricket or the largest female cricket at one and the largest perceived male cricket at four start new trend points where they are the closest in their respective gender
and then every smaller male or female cricket after them has a greater distance from the spider, but still at eight or nine centimeters, they are keeping a good distance from the spider as well. And I observed that they all basically ran away from the spider. So in conclusion, I found that crickets are unlikely to fight spiders alone, while they are also unlikely to team up and face the predators together, and they will instead run away. Overall, I found that leaders amongst crickets have many different characteristics, which would include many different genes. And although through my tests I did find that size plays a large role, I do think there are other factors such as gender, which I mentioned many times throughout my conclusions, however I could not definitively conclude. Leaders in crickets can be detected with behavioral and physical tendencies. For instance, if you see a large cricket that is mobile, which will indirectly mean it may be more likely to be alone, and also more likely to be in the light, you're likely looking at a leader cricket. And that concludes my presentation. I want to thank you all for watching, and if you have any questions, please let me know during my 10-minute time slot starting at 11 a.m. on the day of the science conference.